Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. Going into round 11 of the candidates, Yan Nipomnishi led the field by one and a half points. But of course, still four games to go. It's not over yet. And Nepo had potentially a tricky game in round 11. He was playing Ali Reza Firuz Jar, who seems to be going for it in every single game. But he's obviously not having a good tournament. He lost a disastrous game against Nakamura in the previous round. And in fact, well, how did Firuz Jar cope with that loss? Well, apparently he was playing online chess till five in the morning. In fact, he was playing hyper bullet games against Daniel Naroditsky. They played 268 hyper bullet games. That's 30 seconds for all your move moves, by the way. 268 games. Now, is that the ideal preparation for a classical game of chess in the candidates? Well, maybe that's Firuz Jar's way of letting off steam. If he won this game, you'd say stroke of genius. If he lost the game, then the whole idea not so clever. Let's see what happened. So Firuz Jar with the white pieces and Nepo stick, sticks to his trusty Petrov. It's turned out very well for him so far. And here Firuz Jar plays the something, well, not exactly a main line. He plays c4. So discouraging black from playing d5. I mean, it's been seen before, but it doesn't have a fantastic reputation. It's okay. And the knight is pushed back. And then d4. I mean, one of the problems is that, yeah, of course, it's nice to, to gain some space, but um, it costs time. You can see that black is already slightly better developed, so there shouldn't really be any problems. And at some moment, black will probably want to play d5 anyway. So that's why Firuz Jar decided, OK, I'm going to claim some space with d5. Knight e5, the knight hops into the middle. I mean, this exchange is nothing special for white. Even opens up this diagonal for the bishop and a nice kingside pawn majority, so that's not an issue. So Firuz Jar played knight d4. Castles, knight c3. Now, this is a clever little move from Nepo. Bishop g4. This actually happens quite a lot in the Kalashnikov. I call it the poke. And however white gets out of this threat, there's a slight compromise. You know, do you really want to put your queen here or here? You don't really want to exchange pieces because you can see that after the exchange, then that gives the queen a square. The rooks are connected. I mean, black has no difficulties there, no weaknesses at all. Therefore, Firuz Jar plays f3, and the bishop just drops back. But f3 weakens this diagonal. You know, you'd really much rather have the pawn on f2. Now, you can combine this with a slightly risky strategy, as we'll see. But how advisable that is, well, let's take a look. It's nice to have just provoked this move anyway. You can see, I mean, straight away, you know, the, the pieces step on each other's toes here. C6, good move. So Nepo challenges this pawn. And, well, actually, because white development is quite poor, then it's very hard to hold that pawn on d5. And if you just exchange the pawn off, then actually black has majority of pawns in the centre, no difficulties there at all. You know, something like this. I mean, black is already very active. Castles instead. Pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn. But look, you know, black can play around that pawn. This square, this square. There's potential action on the C file. Queen b6, of course. Very natural. Pinning. But also looking at the b2 square. King h1, naturally. And rook c8, of course. The, the C file is, is open. And the rook sits beautifully there. And white is behind in development. 
Now, I mean, maybe the best idea is just to push that knight away. Something like this. Maybe f3, uh, excuse me, b3. And put the bishop back here. You know, maybe even just give up that pawn. Um, but, you know, that's irritating that this pawn is under fire. But, you know, maybe something like this. And with the bishop here, you can see that the, the rooks are connected on the back rank here. If knight takes bishop b5, well, I think white is going to be okay here, basically. Um, but, but it's kind of interesting that, you know, already you know, black's activity creates problems for white. Uh, and Fiddlesdor decided instead to go for it on the king's side. He wanted to use this space. He wanted to make a virtue out of that pawn on f on f3. But frankly, I think this move g4 is a clear indication that Fiddlesdor is on tilt. He's lost the run of himself. To me, this move just doesn't make sense. If you're developed. If you've managed to bring this bishop over to the king side somewhere, you know, somewhere over here, fine. But at the moment, you know, how does this bishop travel over to the king side? Well, b2 is vulnerable. This is the problem. So if there's no real communication between these pieces in the king side, then it's very unlikely that this attack is going to succeed. I mean, particularly as there are no weaknesses on the king side and and lots of pieces black is very well coordinated so i mean i just think this move it's just too much i don't like it h6 very reasonable stopping the pawn coming to g5 and i mean here you know maybe white should just go for a4 and try to poke black a bit and maybe there's a chance to swing that rook up the board at some moment you know it's still not too bad but i mean i don't like white's king in the long run but after h6 like i said ali Reza was on tilt and he went through with h4 and this really compounds the error of g4 because the king is even worse now you know this is this is vulnerable and there are there are weak squares behind those pawns as well Rook f8, there's no need to overreact. Very good move. The rook comes to the open file. And the bishop prepares just to drop back. And there's going to be action on the e file. g5. Firuz jar careers on. And knight h5. Very simple. Threatens a check. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, white is having to deal with threats now. If f4, then you can just come in and take this. No problem at all. Um, well, king g2 was played, but then knight g6, and that is pretty horrible. So now there's a threat just to play one of these knights into f4, uh, not to mention knight h4 check. I mean, this is it's just an ugly position for white to play. F4 played. I mean, it's the only way you can justify this, really. But now, well, a sacrifice. I mean, nicely played by Nepo. And he was playing very quickly. I mean, he's absolutely in his element here. Bishop takes. Queen takes b2. So this one now threatened by queen and rook. It's also a nasty pin here. That's nice that the rook is on the e-file. Black always has this one in mind as well. So at the moment he's got two pawns for the piece, but so much activity as well. Knight e4 played. I mean, there isn't much better. Rook c4, very sensible. So, I mean, look at those pieces lined up here on the fourth rank. I mean, it's just dreadful. Of course, there's a pin here can't be taken. So bishop e3 just takes the bishop away from the marauding knight. Bishop takes pawn on g5, so now that's three pawns for the piece. 
If bishop takes bishop, then rook takes e4, for example. It's this one. There's pressure here as well. It's winning for black. Knight takes allows rook takes. Again, this one is threatened. And then that one will drop. So rook b1 played, hitting the queen. Queen takes a2, just maintaining the pin. Rook a1, white doesn't have anything better really. And now, very nice move, rook takes knight. So if queen takes, then queen takes bishop. And if bishop takes, then queen takes d5. Now what's the score here? Um, black is a rook down, but there are problems for white with this pin. If bishop f3, then black just crashes through with rook takes e4. And well, you can see that the lack of pawn cover absolutely does for the king. If bishop takes, queen takes, and these minor pieces will, along with the queen, of course, will decide the game. Naturally, queen f3 runs into knight h4. So rook takes d4 just played. Rook takes queen, rook takes, bishop takes, and bishop takes bishop. So uh, knight takes d6. We haven't quite settled yet. There we are. We've just about settled. Um, black has three pawns and a bishop against a rook. So actually, black has a material advantage here. Yeah, I mean, that, that one might drop at some point. But basically, there's going to be an, an attack against the king again. So this was nice judgment from Nepo. Actually, you know, he is completely winning this position. But, you know, at first glance, when you, you look at this from afar, you might think, oh, could be a bit tricky. But Nepo got it absolutely right. So if knight takes b7, check. And then you can take that pawn. So, yeah, we're back to three pawns, basically. Bishop b3 covers that one. Bishop c5 attacks the knight takes and bishop b6 and if knight d6 if the knight comes back then rook e3 is a really nice move hits the bishop and threatens to bring the knight in to start a really dangerous attack against the king i mean it's it's beautiful for black that this bishop is kind of anchored on b6 and once again all black's pieces are ready to start an attack so bishop b6 just played Bishop c4, rook e3, there we go, the rook moves in again. And now the bishop hits the rook, rook c1, bishop f5, very nice, swinging around here, bishop f1, and bishop e4, check, that was the final move of the game. Here, Firuzja resigned. Um, if king h2, Bishop d takes d5 isn't bad, hitting rook and knight. And then you carry on with the attack once you've grabbed your material. And if um, instead of king h2, instead of that, bishop g2, then rook h3 is mate. I think I'm going to leave that final position there. Well, what an absolutely crushing game from Nepo. He played extremely well. He judged the tactics and the initiative beautifully but i have to say firuz jart played dreadfully really poor and you have to question um his his nerve actually you know to yeah. okay you lose a game it's horrible we've all been there it's dreadful but this is the top tournament in the world and you know to spend most of the night playing online blitz you know it's just seems to me to be a big mistake and yeah i think he lost his nerve basically it's just like ah i've given up um but full credit to nepo for taking advantage of these mistakes you know he he executed his attack brilliantly well what about the other games well uh, nakamura and um Rapport had a very long game that ended in a draw. And, well, Caruana against Ding was an absolute roller coaster of a game. Looked like Caruana was doing well, but 
I mean, the game swung back and forth. Um, I mean, I haven't had a chance to look at this in, in great detail, but basically Caruana was trying to get through to Ding's king. And at this point, you thought, wow, maybe he's getting somewhere. But Ding held firm here um, in spite of that pawn on e7. I should say Caruana with white. And round about here, in fact, the game swung round. Um, I guess Caruana should just come over with the queen and probably off the queen exchange king here. It's probably level. But after bishop e3, suddenly Ding had the initiative. Rook h8, and Caruana was short on time. So he gave up his pride and joy, that past e-pawn. And this is what happened. So now Ding is a clear pawn up in this position. Now if he can get that bishop to the long diagonal, that could be pretty nasty. Queen g4, queen came over, queen e5. I think particularly these positions with bishops of opposite colour are incredibly difficult to defend because you can't trade pieces basically. Um, and, you know, it's very hard to counter, say, an attack on the long diagonal. So the game went like this. Check. King g6. King is beautifully safe here on a light square. Queen d2. Bishop c6. There we go. That is a very nasty placement for white. Queen g4. Check. Bishop here. Queen g3. And here I was expecting Ding to keep the queens on the board. But he just chopped off. But his initiative continued because these pawns are still very dangerous in connection with the bishop and rook. And black just has this wonderful initiative and Ding was playing very quickly. It's very hard to defend this position. And Ding's, Ding's judgment was absolutely spot on here because very soon Caruana collapsed completely. check and here Caruana resigned so why did he resign well I guess I mean black has lots of threats here I guess you're threatening just to take and then mate um, and if bishop d6 king h3 rook g2 check the king is forced in the corner and bishop e4 this really doesn't look good for white. Um, and mate threatened a check. Doesn't really get white very far in this position. Um, rook takes g3, <clears throat> coming shortly. Then that's two pawns and still a lethal attack. So yeah, Caruana resigned. Disaster for him. That's two games in a row he's, he's lost. So, the scores. Let's have a quick look. So... Jan Nipomnishi has 8 out of 11. Three games to go. 8 out of 11. Ding has 6.5. And, and then Nakamura 6. And Caruana 5.5. Now we have a tasty pairing in the next round. Nepo plays Naka. That's going to be absolutely fascinating. And Ding has white against Rajabov, who's not in the greatest form. So, well, you know... This tournament is still not over. Three games to go. Nepo has a lead of one and a half. But he's still got to get there. And of course, the fight for second place. Really important. Because as we know, Carlsen might not actually play the World Championship. Actually, he might not defend his title. He has suggested uh, as uh, that. So let's see. Uh, Nepo 8, Ding 6.5. It's going to be a fascinating day tomorrow. Thanks for watching.